Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome. We're very happy to be here from New York. Uh, Mr. Massimiliano Giorni, uh, uh, um, Artistic Director of this Museum and Director of the Trussali Foundation in Milan. Welcome, Massimiliano. Uh, good evening to uh, you all. Now, I met Massimiliano many years back. Approximately 22 years ago, we met for the first time. I was a student and he uh, was already working in Manhattan. At that time, he used to work for Flesh Art. And besides having done lots of things, very different, etc., he has always kept with Milan a relationship of uh, creative uh, endurance. And uh, Massimiliano gives a shock to the city every now and then compelling uh, Milan to make a step forward. It is particularly relevant to have him as a guest during the Salone because his own relationship with the city of Milan was very important because he curated uh, um, contemporary art uh, exhibitions. And this was important to actually have the Milanese people rediscover their city and some uh, venues as well through the, his work with Fondazione Trussaldi. Tell us more about uh, how you conceived uh, this brand new idea at that time, which has been followed uh, by many in different contexts. Well, first of all, thank you very much. Hello, Ilaria, and good evening, everyone. I uh, always feel like uh, a newsman once upon a time uh, talking to the news uh, since I'm not in presence. And thank you very much for your words of introduction. Um, the adventure I went through with the Trussardi Foundation in 2002 and with the first exhibition in 2003 I came from different clues. First of all, I'm not uh, born in Milano. I'm a guy from the province. I was born in Busto Arsizio and I used to be a weekly pilgrim to Milano to visit um, exhibitions, to go to the uh, um, cinema and uh, continue uh, rediscovering and discovering new things. It's a form of education uh, that I've always found very exciting, like uh, discovering a big city as a uh, little uh, boy from the countryside, like um, Marco Valdo, one of the characters of Italian literature. And um, having that particular adventure was basic also in terms of the choice we made to, together with Beatrix Trussardi to bring the foundation literally into the streets and uh, squares of Milan. The foundation was based uh, in Piazza della Scala, the square where the La Scala Theatre is located. And when Beatrix asked me to become uh, director of the foundation, we thought that this was a new opportunity to be a different foundation from other foundations in the in industry of fashion active on the territory at that time. And it was to open this uh, um, kind of mobile museum or nomadic foundation, if you like, to turn the whole city into a sort of stage for the benefit of the arts. And so the idea of inviting artists came from that. Uh, artists used to open up the city by putting uh, artworks in public spaces or making public some venues which were just forgotten or secret or abandoned and uh, needed, for instance, to be um, refurbished uh, so that to, they could be open uh, opened and changed uh, through the energy of art. Uh, the reaction was also um, a, a kind of restless reaction for a kind of a uh, nursery rhyme that people used to uh, sing every single year. Uh, they used to say uh, that uh, uh, every single time the local administration uh, changed they all flanked around uh, the idea of opening up a contemporary art museum. At that time, we thought that, you know, it was also important to pinpoint that the museum was already there and probably the museum was no longer to be considered as being a piece of hardware, but just a piece of software, so that art could become available to everyone rather than just being a physical location. This was another fundamental aspect, which is still fundamental in terms of uh, uh, planning work. Um, exhibitions must be free of charge, uh, must be accessible, 
and they of course uh, people stumbling into them rather than be closed into a kind of ivory tower uh, which is just inaccessible to most and this i also believe is a kind of educational related mission and maybe freer than the notion that art uh, indeed becomes accessible to all and uh, art must uh, speak a language which should not necessarily be an academic one we believe that it is important to set up exhibitions which in one, on the one hand uh, are not going to be expressed uh, with an academic jargon whilst on the other they should not require art uh, to uh, become just a banal exercise before you were mentioning the fact that some of our exhibitions shocked people this is due to the fact that we never thought that uh, having art to become more public was uh, in one way or another uh, sugar coating uh, art uh, the most famous case was the hang kid by maurizio catalan some 15 years ago but this is a central attitude within the framework of the work carried out by the Crusade foundation which means bringing contemporary art and its own radicalism into everyday life and this is a pattern that developed in parallel with the salone del mobile this idea of a kind of a mobile party that uh, mm, uh, catches the city by surprise and uh, spreads around artistic content into the very connective pattern of the city and makes Milanese people discover places close to where they live and maybe never entered. Uh, but before actually um, talking to something else, out of all the exhibitions in Milan, which is your favorite one? Ever since uh, I have a kid and I just had an only kid, uh, you know, I may say that you cannot make preferences. Exhibitions are like uh, your kids, you know, um, uh, every single time is a surprise, is an amazement. And the last one with Richard uh, uh, Wagner was a very difficult uh, uh, challenge because uh, it was organized in between the end of the first lockdown period and the beginning of a very tough autumn and therefore this was an exhibition which was organized in the lazaretto church so with great symbols and uh, clues and uh, this is an exhibition which opened uh, for just one month and it was just uh, by mere chance that uh, you could do that and that's why it's in my heart for many reasons because this was also an exhibition talking about milan and talking about uh, what the cities in italy were going through uh, singers were playing indefinitely a melodrama like version of uh, a song titled uh, uh, the skies in one room and uh, this is what i remember more vividly but uh, there are uh, others fishly advice at uh, palazzo lita sara locas into the public baths uh, but also see how all these adventures opened up uh, uh, the secrecy of those uh, venues uh, which uh, came to have a new identity and so they kind of dismantled uh, the closeness of what they used to be. Uh, Flishy Weiss and Peter Fischi um, uh, were particularly important because a very important aspect in terms of the exhibitions of Trussardi is that you know that uh, um, you will display in no other place and the one where you displayed your artworks uh, uh, because if you uh, have an exhibition in a museum sometimes you get you know uh, your satisfaction spoils because you know that there are other people who are going to display their artworks in the same venue where you have displayed yours and this might be unpleasant for you and uh, you started from the artist or you started from the venue and you went to look for the artist well it's always a kind of a combination there are artists uh, with whom we want to work uh, some some of them are not even aware of that and so we're looking for venues and they're not aware of it and therefore we just offered them certain venues there are other venues which we treasure um, and therefore you go look for an artist because you like a venue 
very much. So there isn't a single recipe with no failure of course, of faults. And this is another special aspect of the foundation. There is no uh, golden rule or fixed rule. And so there is always flexibility, which makes uh, collaboration with artists good and uh, more special what you do on the spot. It's a kind of a tailored effort. We are at the Salone del Mobile and you talk about uh, space, you talk about uh, how to set things up. You're a curator, this is a big theme because a, um, an exhibition must become physical and visual. How do you go about that? How, how do you go about to make it physical? You work on the paper, you draw, you start from the space, from the artwork or what? Well, I have some mottos so to say, which are first of all, one which I uh, found on a towel on a uh, bed and breakfast, a place for everything and everything in its place. And um, the uh, exhibition must uh, have a thing of uh, uh, inevitability, so to say, this has to be kept in the context of a point cube or in far more layered places such as uh, those in, of exhibitions in historical venues in Milan or elsewhere. So this uh, sense of uh, um, impossibility to avoid things. So you go find the exhibition in the place, uh, which is its own ideal uh, context uh, or box. Uh, the exhibition has to be set up as if it were perfectly built up for that particular venue. There has to be this sense of unavoid unavoidability uh, and you have to have the feeling that uh, just a few inches away this exhibition would be different or differently perceived. Another founding principle of this uh, Ten Commandments uh, um, ruled out by a Trump so to say, is that uh, curating starts at two. Uh, uh, is, uh, um, it's a dialogue um, and you have to have more than one person sharing. Uh, uh, you have the place and the artwork, the artwork and the artist, uh, the artist and the curator, but especially artworks and the audience and the curator is a kind of first member of the audience a first reader and interpreter of that particular artwork and it's important when you think about curating an exhibition that there is a dialogue between the artwork and space and a dialogue between artwork and 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 amongst artworks as well i believe that if we refrain and we just uh, you know put a, an artwork into a room this is selecting and not curating you have to create uh, a narrative a dialogue amongst uh, artworks or places and then i have a principle which is maybe less uh, stringent uh, that couples uh, me with many uh, exhibitions um, and I quote Andy Warhol, Lou Reed asked him whether Velvet Underground's uh, songs were too long. Andy Warhol was the producer of the first uh, uh, records by Velvet Underground and he said, uh, always leave them wanting less. Well, you only have to make sure that songs are long enough and for people uh, to be satisfied and even for wanting less of those songs. And uh, this, of course, uh, refers uh, to those exhibitions where you kind of get lost and this happens at times. And this same approach comes from David Weiss' statement, who said when Fish Weiss uh, made, sadly, in this overview, they wanted this piece of work to be so big so that nobody could really remind this in detail. And uh, another idea they had back in Disneyland in the 70s at the theme park, perhaps uh, after being on drugs, perhaps, uh, well, they were very struck by the fact that they could not see anything in the surroundings. And so the experience uh, of that place of fantasy was so vast uh, that they could not see any borders. So again, there were no data they were kept in mind. So 
it would still have this this feature of uh, excess of being too much uh, so that the experience will be truly immersive although i don't like this adjective too much and that is something that i pursue in milan exhibitions and often milan exhibitions have that so this idea uh, about vast spaces space where you currently where well, you're actually being surrounded by and the place itself becomes part of the exhibition itself. So these are some of the key features. Uh, then, of course, when you organize exhibitions, well, each and every time you start from scratch with the artist. So many of these rules uh, are to be completely discarded because you have to consider the artist and that very artist on that occasion. And then the secret recipe is also to have the best team, the best staff around you. And the Fundación is a very good example because we have been working over the years with the same people and, and we're actually having some nice flexibility now as, we, as, we, as we've been working together for a long time. So you can actually make the artist happy. And that, the secret lies in actually working well and getting along well with the people you work with. Back to team. Well, for some of your most important exhibitions uh, in Biennale, for instance, you did also work with architects. So how about this balance between artists, curator, and so on? So how is this balance being reached? Well, let me tell you that Biennale was very much an exception because usually I like to, to, let's say, design exhibitions by myself. And it's not because I'm an egocentric, but because, I, because it's way easier, you know? And often I do refer to the same people that I've been working with for ages. And so um, also we share SketchUp, which is a software that it's a very basic one, but actually through that software, we know how to handle it, you know? Something else that I do, I do like to measure venues uh, uh, while walking around it. Uh, and that helps me also in organizing the next exhibition. And sometimes I have my laser measurer so that I can check the venue sizes, for instance, or maybe I do put some scotch tape on the floor when the museum is closed. Uh, so that I, again, I gain the idea of the size of the premise of, of the premises and so on. But back to your question, actually, when it comes to organizing a, an exhibition beyond narrative, beyond the storytelling, it's also about the distance between a painting and neck, or how many paintings are you going to be hanging on that wall? So it is very much a truly practical work. You need to do a lot of measurement, literally, and you create like a puzzle, you know, where you're fitting all the pieces together. And that is something that I like to do by myself, of course, along with the people from my staff. And again, these people have been the same for many years. In Biennale, in Biennale sorry, I had a co-work with a, a Anna a Del Selpo, a great architect. She's very good in organizing venues, in organizing exhibitions. So she's been involved in many exhibitions, international exhibitions as well. She's also a, a great collaborator to work with because she's very good in having a constructive conversation and uh, she's and she loves talking to people. So she's ready to welcome, to listen and so on. Actually, my collaboration with her in Venice was born like, kind of randomly, by chance, literally. We were just sitting next to each other on a dinner and uh, I was uh, talking through Arsenal and I, and I, I used to say, I, I, I kept on saying that I wanted to uh, kind of change the character, the personality of, of that place because I thought it was a bit outdated. And uh, so we were having this conversation, and I remember whether it was me or her, I can't recall, but we both, we both said, how about we neutralize it? 
and uh, hence the collaboration started. And the Arsenale was then being transformed into a kind of a temporary museum. So I, I like this provocation of using Arsenale, well, of course, and not completely uh, eliminating it, it is a beautiful place, but actually perhaps uh, providing it with different atmospheres, you know, providing it with a different personality. So we were building together on that. And, uh, and we did approach it in a, different, in a different way. And by the way, I'm now working with Anna, again, in a different context in Shanghai for a long museum exhibition, which again is a, is a huge, is a paramount, is a gigantic venue, uh, all in concrete, reinforced concrete. So it's lovely that we can now work together once again and I like her again because uh, she can manage this, uh, uh, these huge places uh, as a surgeon would do, you know. In New York, we're also considering the expansion of a new museum. It's a special venue that's been designed by Sijima, uh, and we're now duplicating spaces right now as we speak. And the Rem Kulas as uh, and OME have designed a new museum. And again, this is all based and it comes from uh, conversation, successful conversation. You know, I thought architects were, uh, were kind of a more selfish, egocentric by definition, by their nature. But actually, I was surprised uh, to find out that many architects, uh, uh, they're even more interested in listening to you uh, and listening. Rather than, uh, rather than just imposing their own final solutions. And that, uh, I was taken by surprise, I have to say. In my everyday life, I, I do have lots of conversations with artists, and at times we struggle, of course, which makes sense. Uh, but, but I love it when conversation can become cons constructive. And I was pleased that I could find in architects, uh, partners, you know, new partners, collaborators, people to work with uh, in a constructive manner. Um, and, and that is also very true for Milan. There are many venues which are filled up with architecture. If you consider the history of Fondazione Trussardi, it's curious uh, to, to find out that actually Milan, the city of Milan was expanding in some, uh, in a historical moment, if you take the neoclassical, for instance, Caselli from Pier Marini, and then between neoclassical and Baroque, Palazzo Citterio, Palazzo Litta, and then uh, the fascism in Milan, Arengario is a good example. Uh, and neoclassic, back to the neoclassic, I, I'd love to mention Arena as well, which is a 1700 building, uh, and uh, as well as the Caselli in Porta Venezia. So there have been moments in history, in the history of city, that have literally accelerated that development. So uh, we, we kind of use architecture in those instances, uh, in those instances as a ready-made place, and that is a that is a meaning in itself. So you have to consider the architecture as well. You have to be fully respectful as well as responsible as you are organizing exhibitions in those venues. Uh, and you don't want to create any inconsistency, you know, there has to be a complete consistency between the architecture of the venue welcoming the object and the object themselves. And actually interesting things may happen and there, there's something else that I find very interesting for the artist because usually, you know, a uh, work of art uh, would be exhibited uh, in a very general white cube, uh, whereas if you organize it in a, in a specific architecture, then it makes sense also because there's the historical meeting that heads on, you know, heads up. In this one and a half virtual year we have we've just lived because of the pandemic and uh, many many artists uh, have uh, experimented uh, in, uh, in in making pieces of art uh, through augmented reality and uh, is it changing at all the way a curator considered the venues or, or, or actually nothing has changed in your view Well, now, um, now it is it is not a, a personal issue that I'm 
that I'm talking through here, and I'm not saying it was complex, uh, but of course, uh, I had to manage uh, putting off uh, exhibitions. And I understand uh, that there has been pain for a lot of people on that. But to make some practical examples, you know, uh, Kondo, Shanghai, that will be the first time uh, when I, well, actually the second time in my life, uh, because that happened with Aragnar as well, where I'm not seeing the, the exhibition in person. So it was supposed to open, it is, it is, uh, it's going to be open in Shanghai and you can't travel to Shanghai right now unless you're able to actually be there three weeks in advance and do a number of things. And so neither myself nor the artist are going to be there. Uh, so we're currently curating the setup from distance, from remote. So back to your question, uh, I had already started to work on that. But again, I'd love to mention that the importance uh, of a developing nice relationship with, with people, with, with your staff. Uh, so you perhaps uh, may have your staff traveling to the venue beforehand, and then I can do some remote work meanwhile. And, and this is only feasible, this is only viable if you have uh, people you rely on uh, around you. And uh, so thank goodness, these tools uh, have been developed already, uh, even before the pandemic. Uh, um, uh, because uh, as I said, at times, I do take measurements of the venues, even when people don't even realize that I'm taking measurements, because I like to walk around, I like to do things by myself, I like to be, I'm a very hands-on person, and I like to work on simulations as well. And this is something that I'm currently doing in New York with the new museum, for instance. And that is a, an exercise that, of course, has become kind of compulsory because of the pandemic. So actually, the key change um, after the pandemic, and of course, I'm not talking about a, such a major change, of course, there have been more severe consequences. But let's say in our context, the key change has been to be able to work effectively, though remotely, and uh, being able to recreate that kind of physical experience, although it is only a virtual one. And uh, so the exhibition in Shanghai, again, I, I'm not, I, I can't really say whether or not I'll be able to be there in person. I'm working with Jeff Kunza, Doha, uh, that has been also postponed a number of times. So there's still there, there, there are some hurdles that at times you can uh, uh, kind of overcome, you know, through virtual tools and so on. Um, you, you mentioned adapting uh, exhibition in the new museum, which, thank goodness, I was able to curate myself. And we were actually also able to bring the artist come over so that he could be there in person. Um, and the exhibition itself it speaks about distance. And he tells and he shows about how the artist can be transformed into an alter ego. And you see the artist speaking over the phone to his mom and that he hasn't met for, for over one and a half year, you know? So that, uh, like, like that has been the case for many of us, of course. And um, so it is like a, and I'm quoting the title of an Italian book. So inhabiting distances, uh, abitare distanze, and uh, and that has indeed become something that we have to be very good at uh, and learn how to cope with it. And also taking uh, the, the love life for all of us also, that has been quite challenging, although it might sound banal. I mean, it's been going on for such a long time. It's been over one and a half year now, and we don't even know whether this is an exception or this is perhaps the new normal, you know? I still hope that we can still call it exception, but uh, actually that is kind of a condition uh, that is impacting our life quite on a regular basis. Are you currently working on, on what? You mentioned Jeff Koons in Qatar, Long Museum uh, from Kondo. And how about New Museum? What, 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 what's boiling out there? And, well, there has been a kind of a coincidence of exhibitions that uh, they were not scheduled not to open at the same time, actually. But like we've 
seen, we, we've just seen this past summer, we've opened a new project with Beatrice Trossardi in Switzerland. So there, there has been kind of a collision, if you will, of exhibitions that have been postponed over times. And then, then all of a sudden, they're now happening to open all together. And the event of Kunst, it was supposed to open only one month apart from the prior one and from the next one. And not because I'm any crazy, of course, but because of a, we were supposed to put that off by, by, by some months because of the pandemic. And actually, Kondo was, was about to open even earlier than that, uh, beginning of 2020. Now, New Museum, we're opening Triennale, which is not being curated by myself, though. And that will be October, Mark Norton. And the exhibition at the New Museum uh, is Fit Pringle exhibition that is going to be opening in February next year, so 2022. And they... Uh, and then the exhibition with Fondazione Beatrice Trussardi has closed, I would say, last week, last week in, a, um, in a Engadina, Switzerland. Um, and back to your question, that was a, an exhibition that I was actually able to see and attend in person and curating in person. And that was an, uh, kind of my answer to this moment of this moment in time where we're asking ourselves, uh, what are the functions and roles of institution nowadays? And this was uh, an exhibition which was a kind of a uh, small uh, lay chapel or a spiritual chapel set up in a hut at 2000 meters of height which you could reach only on foot or by carriage. It was a kind of a memorial where there was a statue of St. Francis uh, who was uh, uh, leaving his earthen uh, prophecy and uh, a Madonna, um, a wooden Madonna with a child um, out of a piece of wood uh, found there and uh, some earthenware uh, which was uh, produced there and uh, um, truly an exhibition which was uh, produced and uh, made on the spot inviting us to rethink about uh, the notion of site specific so of specificity inspiration uh, almost at a local level which was a way as it were for the other exhibition a kind of a question mark in terms of uh, the meaning of an audience to get back to your question uh, because of the fact that we had uh, restrictions in terms of number of uh, visitors and also a public exhibition uh, invites us to wonder whether having many visitors is uh, the answer we need to uh, indeed uh, fulfill all the questions that are being uh, asked by all artists or whether you know our institutions have to come to terms with um, questions that are fundamental also from the point of view of survival of the institution and accountability by the institutions as well. We've gone through for years and years, for tens of years, uh, an equation which is the success equals uh, a high number of visitors and all of a sudden this pandemic has forced us to come to terms with and rethink. Well, let's end by asking you a couple of things. You now have a kid. The relationship uh, between you and your kid and about art. I have two daughters and uh, uh, my daughter wants to play sports. So if I ask her to go visit an exhibition, she keeps answering me. I've already seen one, although the artist was different in the venue was different. The second daughter uh, pretends um, she didn't hear me and uh, um, so videos and installations are art anyway and I 
uh, you know, was very proud of this message. My daughters don't uh, like um, exhibitions. They love artists. If there is an artist visiting home, uh, they befriend and they love him or her. What are the, your kids? Well, uh, is rather is rather uh, is rather uh, young. He's only six years old. Uh, you can still drag him around, but he starts rebelling uh, if we force him to visit the exhibitions. We went to the opening of the Luma Foundation, and he had a sort of uh, uh, um, uh, raging moment uh, before the Van Gogh exhibition. Uh, he was drawing his own version of a self-portrait by Van Gogh. Um, and uh, this, I fear, shows a predisposition to drawing an art which might be worrisome. No, I'm just joking, of course. Uh, but he's very much interested. He likes it. Uh, I believe it's getting to the face uh, when he wants to voice with a great deal of determination his own independence. The other day he was saying something about Cecilia. He said, uh, maybe this is something to do with the Venice Biennale because uh, uh, we uh, joke with him because uh, we say to him that he speaks Italian like uh, Mrs. Ethel Parisi, um, an Italian vedette. His dream right now is to become a paleontologist. Let's so that he uh, takes up science, nothing to do with us, but from others. But he has two parents addressing him to arts, and so the likelihood is uh, really a factor. So, whether for the good or for the bad, either he's going to be an artist or a paleontologist, uh, well, thank you very much. It was a pleasure chatting with you. Hope to see you in Milan soon with your wonderful projects uh, because uh, for us in Milano, your projects in Milano are a kind of a calendar because uh, they are just like uh, a mark on a calendar uh, and they are being remembered. So we're looking forward to your next uh, exhibition in Milano and thank you very much. Um, uh, again, thank you. Uh, talking about the pandemic, etc. I, I have the. I'm under the impression that I'm speaking to the vacuum. But you had lots of fans. Uh, we got telephone calls this morning of people asking you um, how you could get to see you while in the streaming. Um, maybe it was my dad because I have quite a thick family, and um, so every one of us were, uh, you know, taken. Back right now, but we gave them the right information. Thank you very much indeed.